Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us from the comfort and safety of wherever you may be. My name is Candace Summers. I'm the Director of Education here at the McLean County Museum of History, and we, in partnership with the League of Women Voters of McLean County, along with Illinois Humanities, are pleased to welcome musician Phil Passan, who will perform songs on his hammered dulcimer about women's suffrage, along with additional songs about women's role in the mid-19th and early 20th centuries. We are pleased to bring you this program in honor of the 100th anniversary of suffrage, which is still going on this year. And we are delighted to have Phil with us so we could live stream this event um, so that you can watch anywhere. I would like to take the time to thank Illinois Humanities for a grant we received to bring Phil here. Illinois Humanities is supported in part by the National Endowment of the Humanities and the Illinois General Assembly, as well as by contributions from individuals like you and foundations and corporations. At the, uh, in the program's event, I will be putting in there a survey, and we please ask you to take a moment, fill that survey out, because that's how it helps organizations like us continue to get grants. And we also encourage you to support humanities programs and institutions wherever you may be, especially during this very challenging time for all of us. Phil is a native of Ohio, and a few musicians play the hammered dulcimer. Fewer still sing while accompanying themselves on this fascinating instrument, and he does both. He was a full-time activist in the anti-war and civil rights movement in the 1960s and 70s before he became involved in folk music. Itching to learn how to play a musical instrument, Phil did not pick up the dulcimer until 1994 when he saw it being performed in a concert, and he's been playing ever since. So without further ado, I'm going to welcome Phil Passan. Thank you very much, Candace. Thanks to the museum for having me, and thanks to uh, Illinois Humanities for sponsoring uh, this program through their Road Scholars program. Did she leave home that morning with a song in her heart? Did she walk or take the tram or drive her own horse and cart? Did she march up to that town hall without fear or shame? And can anybody tell me now what was her name? What was her name? Tell me what was her name? That woman striding up to the ballot box to claim the right to make her mark and set the world aflame. She's a sister of mine. Tell me what was her name? Was she a real lady in her bombazine and furs? Was the hard life of a miner's wife hers? Once you're in that voting booth, it's all the same. And can anybody tell me now what was her name? What was her name? Tell me what was her name? That woman striding up to the ballot box to claim the right to make her mark and set the world aflame. She's a sister of mine, tell me what was her name? Did she understand the fight that got us to this place? Did she have a husband thought it was a national disgrace? Was she part of the struggle? Was she her dame? And can anybody tell me now what was her name? What was her name? Tell me what was her name? That woman striding up to the ballot box to claim the right to make her mark and set the world aflame. She's a sister of mine. Tell me what was her name? Some, some take it for granted when they go down to vote. Some think it's a nuisance and they'd really rather not. But the right to have my say is one I'll always claim. Like that sister before I'll go and sign my name. What was her name? Tell me what was her name. 
That woman striding up to the ballot box to claim the right to make her mark and set the world aflame. She's a sister of mine, tell me, what was her name? What was her name? Tell me, what was her name? That woman striding up to the ballot box to claim the right to make her mark and set the world aflame. She's a sister of mine, tell me, what was her name? That song was written by Australian folk singer Judy Small as part of the uh, the uh, centennial celebration of Australian women winning the right to vote. And it's a reminder that when any new great thing happens, whether it's uh, something new in a, in a creative field, an artistic uh, movement or technique, uh, a new uh, social struggle that has broken out, or a political movement, or a scientific uh, technique or discovery, there's always someone, and sometimes some ones, who are the brave souls who went first. And speaking of firsts, uh, in 1648, Margaret Brent became the first person, the first woman uh, in what became the United States uh, to demand uh, the right to vote. She went before the Maryland Provisional Assembly and demanded the right to speak and to vote, and she was denied on the grounds that the only women who could be granted such rights were queens. In 1832 in Boston, uh, a free African-American woman named Maria Stewart became uh, the first woman that we know of who gave a public lecture to an audience of black and white men and women. She attacked and described the oppression of African-Americans, uh, the institution of slavery, and demanded uh, complete freedom and uh, total equal rights and equality for all African-American women and men. In 1848, 200 years after uh, after Margaret Brent, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott convened the Seneca Falls Convention in upstate New York, which launched what is called the first wave of feminism. And it also launched the organized struggle for women's suffrage, uh, which of course culminated in uh, 1920 with the ratification of the 19th Amendment. But the struggle for equal rights for women goes on. Uh, and in 19. 76, during the middle of the struggle to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment, the educational, uh, children's educational program Schoolhouse Rock ran this song uh, as uh, part of their focus on teaching kids the history of things going on around them. Well, you have heard of women's rights and how we've tried to reach new heights and if we're all created equal well that's us too but you will probably not recall that it's not been too long at all since we even had the right to cast a vote well sure some men bowed down and called us missus let us hang out the wash and wash the dishes but when time came around to elect a president they said see you later alligator and don't forget my my mashed potatoes cause i'm going downtown to cast my vote for president how oh, we were suffering without suffrage not a woman could vote no matter what her age then the 19th Amendment struck down that restrictive rule. And now we pull down on the lever. We cast our ballots and we endeavor to improve our country, state, county, town, and school. Those pilgrim women who braved the boat, they cooked a turkey, but they could not vote. Even Betsy Ross, who sewed the flag, was left behind on election day. Then Susan B. Anthony and Julia Howe, Lucretia Mott, they showed us how. They carried signs and marched in lines until that law was passed. How oh, we were suffering without suffrage. Not a woman could vote no matter what her age. Then the 19th Amendment struck down that restrictive rule. 
And now we pull down on the lever. We cast our ballots and we endeavor to improve our country, state, county, town, and school. Oh, the 19th Amendment struck down that restrictive rule. Yes, the 19th Amendment struck down that restrictive rule. Right on, sisters, right on. Yes, the 19th Amendment struck down that restrictive rule. <laughs> well, the, at the Seneca Falls uh, Convention in 1848, the resolution demanding uh, the vote for woman, woman su women's, women's suffrage, was only one of 11 resolutions passed by the uh, convention. The others all dealt with other aspects of equal rights for women. The need, for example, for a woman to uh, have the right to sue for divorce. The need for a woman to be able to sign a legal contract. The need for a woman to, be, to have the right to control her own property uh, and not have it automatically passed to her husband, to her husband uh, as soon as she got married without her having anything to ever say about it again. And the suffrage resolution was the only one of those 11 that did not pass unanimously. Women were very concerned with the ridicule, the scorn, the mockery, and the physical violence that would be directed at them if they began to organize for suffrage. And they were right to be concerned about, uh, about those things. And the suffrage resolution passed uh, at Seneca Falls uh, by a very narrow margin, primarily on the basis of an impassioned speech given in its favor by one of the few men at the convention, and that was Frederick Douglass. This uh, song I have read was the most popular song sung at women's suffrage events, uh, probably because it was uh, sung to, a, it sung to a, a melody that was very well known then as now, and that's the melody used for Robert Burns' Auld Lang Syne. This song was copywritten by a D.A. Estabrook in 1883. I have a neighbor, one of those not very hard to find, who know it all without debate and never change their mind. I asked him what of woman's rights, he answered with a sneer, I on that my mind is all made up, keep woman in her sphere. I saw a man in tattered garb forth from the grog shop come. He squandered all his cash on drink and starved his wife at home. I asked him, should not woman vote? He said in tones severe, I've taught my wife to know her place, keep woman in her sphere. An earnest, thoughtful man, not many days ago, who pondered deep all human law, the honest truth to know. I asked him, what of woman's cause? The answer came sincere. Her rights are just the same as mine. Let woman choose her sphere. Her rights are just the same as mine. Let woman choose her sphere. <laughs> That's pretty good virtual applause, isn't it? Um, 
the almost all, maybe all of the early uh, suffragists uh, were also activists in the abolitionist movement, the movement to abolish slavery. In 1869, there was a split in the suffrage movement and between a section of the suffrage movement and the abolitionist movement when uh, Frederick Douglass and other abolitionist leaders uh, decided to temporarily table the struggle for woman suffrage. Until then, the movement for suffrage really had been a movement for universal suffrage, for the vote, for the right to vote for African American men and for all women. Uh, but Douglas and others decided that if they mixed the two issues at that point, they, because what they wanted to do was they wanted to put all their emphasis on and all their uh, effort on the ratification of the 15th Amendment by which African American men would win the right to vote. And they felt that if they combined the two issues, African American male suffrage and woman suffrage, they might not get either. And they were probably right because of the tremendous opposition to woman's suffrage. Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, among others, were furious at this. They felt that if women didn't get the vote then, they would never get it. They broke relations with Douglas. They had actually been very close friends, especially Susan B. Anthony. That friendship was rekindled later in life, but it was for now it was broken. And they formed an organization, uh, Stanton and Susan B. Anthony and others did, called the National Women's Suffrage Association, which campaigned actively against the 15th Amendment, against the right of African American men to vote. Uh, and they allied with racists and they used racist arguments in order to do so. And they continued to campaign for, on a national basis, for, a, uh, for woman's suffrage. Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin, uh, Francis Watkins Harper, Harriet Tubman, uh, and uh, Lucy Stone, uh, Julia Ward Howe, William Lloyd Garrison, and others formed another organization, the American Women's Suffrage Association, and they campaigned nationally for the 15th Amendment, for the right of African American men to vote. Uh, they stopped campaigning nationally for women's suffrage, but they continued to campaign actively and aggressively on a state-by-state -state basis for women's suffrage. And by the way, in 1870, after the ratification of the 15th Amendment, Frederick Douglass resumed active campaigning for women's suffrage. Among the speakers that were very popular for both uh, abolition and suffrage, the two most popular were Frederick Douglass and Sojourner Truth. And in 1851, Sojourner Truth gave a, uh, an extemporaneous, off-the-cuff speech to the Ohio Women's Rights Convention in Akron, Ohio, in uh, which several years later was transcribed from notes and memory uh, by one of the women who chaired the convention. And that transcription has become known as Sojourner Truth's Ain't I a Woman speech. And this musical setting for, for it was done by uh, the Chicago area folk singer Kristen Lem. So this is Sojourner Truth's 1851 speech, Ain't I a Woman. That man over there say a woman needs to be helped into carriages and lifted over ditches and have the best place everywhere. Nobody ever helped me into carriages or over mud puddles or gave me a best place. And ain't I a woman? Look at me, look at my arm. I have plowed and planted and gathered into barns, and no man could head me. And ain't I a woman? I could work as much and eat as much as a man when I could get it and bear the lash as well. And ain't I a woman? I have borne five children and seen most all sold into slavery. And when I cried out a mother's grief, none but Jesus heard me. And ain't I a woman? That 
that little man over there say a woman can't have as much rights as a man cause Christ wasn't a woman where did your Christ come from from God and a woman man had nothing to do with him. In uh, 1845, Lucy Stone, who went on to become a very important suffrage leader, was a student at Oberlin College in Ohio, and to earn part of her tuition, she took a job student teaching arithmetic in the ladies' department of the college, as it was called, and for that she was paid half of what male students were paid for doing the exact same kind of student teaching. And she protested, went to the faculty board, and demanded that she be paid the same salary that men were paid for doing the same work. Uh, and the uh, faculty board refused, and Lucy Stone went on strike. Her students overwhelmingly supported her. They actually offered to pay her tuition, which she graciously declined. Uh, she stayed on strike for three months, and she won her strike. The faculty board finally agreed to pay her and all the women doing student teaching the same salary that men got for doing the same work. Today, the average earnings of women are about 78% of that of men, uh, and that doesn't even include all the unpaid work that women do around the house. In 1981, when Fred Small wrote this song, the average earnings of women were about 59% of that of men. High school daydreams come easy and free. When you're a working woman, what you're gonna be? A senator, a surgeon, aim for the heights. But the guidance office says, lower your sides to 59 cents. For every man's dollar, 59 cents. It's a low-down deal. 59 cents makes a grown woman holler. They give you a diploma. It's your paycheck they steal. She's off to college, the elite kind, to polish her manners and sharpen her mind. Honors in English, letter in lacrosse, types her to type for her favorite boss at 59 cents. For every man's dollar, 59 cents, it's a low-down deal. 59 cents makes a grown woman holler, they give you a degree, it's your paycheck they steal. Junior executive on her way up, special assistant to the man at the top. She's one in a million, and what has she found? Her own secretary to order around at 59 cents for every man's dollar. 59 cents, it's a low down deal. 59 cents makes a grown woman holler. They give you a title, it's your paycheck they steal. The words being processed in the typing pool. A working woman ain't nobody's fool. She's telling the boss on Secretary's Day, keep your flowers, buddy, give us a raise to more than 59 cents for every man's dollar. 59 cents, the deal has changed. 59 cents makes a grown woman holler. Keep your flowers, buddy, give us a raise. 59 cents. For every man's dollar, 59 cents. The deal has changed. 59 cents makes a grown woman holler. You can keep your flowers, buddy. Give us a raise. There are a crowd.
quick, a few quick uh, milestones of the suffrage movement. Uh, after uh, the 1848 Seneca Falls Convention, just a couple years later in 1850, the first National Women's Rights Convention was held in Worcester, Massachusetts. Uh, in 1869, Wyoming became the first territory or state in which women won full suffrage, that is the right to vote in all elections, including presidential elections. In 1896, the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs was formed by uh, Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin, Mary Church Ter Terrell, Ida B. Wells, Harriet Tubman, and others, because by then, the systemic institutionalized racism, which was so great in this country, and it's, which had really taken hold after the defeat of Reconstruction, was such that the mostly middle-class white suffrage organizations excluded African-American women from joining. Uh, and African-American women had been in the forefront of the fight for suffrage, so they formed their own organizations. And that organization and also the National American uh, Women's Suffrage Association, which was led by Susan B. Anthony and later Carrie Chapman Catt, uh, and, and other organizations for decades carried on mass leafleting campaigns, national speaking tours, mass marches. The first Women's March on Washington was a march uh, for suffrage in 1913 of 8,000 women the march was uh, attacked by cops and by mobs who chased the women, threw rocks at them, caught them, beat them. It was actually a very brave and often dangerous thing to do to be an activist in the suffrage movement. But just a couple years later in 1915 in New York City, there was a, a march of 45,000 people for suffrage. In 1916, Jeanette Rankin from Montana became the first woman elected to the U.S. Congress. In 1917, Alice Paul and the National Woman's Party, which she led, called for picketing in favor of suffrage in front of the White House. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of women participated in that picketing. Many were arrested, taken to prison, taken to jail. Some were brutally beaten by prison guards. Others were brutally and violently force-fed when they tried to go on hunger strike. And in fact, it was the public outrage at the brutality with which those women were treated that was uh, a key factor in the final push uh, toward uh, women winning the right to vote. And in 1919, in June, U.S. Congress passed the 19th Amendment, which uh, forbids the federal government or states from denying the right to vote on the basis of sex. And in August of 1920, Tennessee became the 36th and final necessary state for ratification to ratify uh, the amendment, and it became law. Uh, and by the way, the first three states to ratify the amendment uh, back in 1919 after Congress passed it were Illinois, Michigan, and Wisconsin. And just to make it clear, the, by, by, with the 19th Amendment, all women, black and white, won the right to vote. All women could vote except Native American women who did not win the right to vote until uh, they won the, Indi the passage of the Indian Citizenship Act in 1924. Uh, but as we know, uh, for decades, uh, many states and localities, primarily but not, all, but not only in the South, deliberately suppressed the actual opportunity to vote of African American, uh, African -American men and women um, by, with poll taxes, uh, literacy tests, ID requirements, re residency requirements, and so forth. And it wasn't until uh, 1964 and 65 uh, when uh, the Civil Rights Movement won great victories with the 24th Amendment, the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, that states were no longer permitted to do those uh, things by these pieces of legislation, and the real opportunity to vote was opened up for uh, tens of thousands, uh, hundreds of thousands of African Americans, women, and men. And we know that uh, today, voter suppression tactics have reared uh, their head again in, in large, uh, to a large extent in many uh, places all over the country through use of the same old techniques and also uh, the limitations on early voting and uh, the elimination of polling places, limitations on uh, mail-in voting. Uh, the, the fight against voter suppression is actually a continuation of the fight for women's suffrage and for, uh, for African-American suffrage and for, for, uh, for universal suffrage. Here's another song that was uh, very popular during the uh, woman suffrage movement. 
This was copywritten in 1912 by uh, a Mrs. D. A. by a Mrs. A. B. Smith. I've been down to Madison to see the folks in sights. You'd laugh, I'm sure, to hear them talk about the women's rights. For it's just as plain as my old hat, as plain can plain can be, that if the women want the vote, they'll get no help from me. Not from Joe, not from Joe. If he knows it, not from Joseph. No, 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 not from Joe, not from me, I tell you no. Say, friend Joseph, why not we should vote the same as you? Are there no problems in this state that need our wisdom too? We must pay our taxes, same as you, as citizens be true. And if some wicked thing we do, we're sent to jail by you. Yes, we are, same as you. And you know it, don't you, Joseph? Yes, you do. Yet you boast, you'll not help us win the vote. Oh, dear women, don't you see? The home is your true sphere. Just think of going to the polls, perhaps two times a year. You're wasting time you ought to spend in sewing hard work. Your home neglected all those hours would you such duties shirk. Help from Joe, help from Joe. If he knows it, not from Joseph. No, 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 not from Joe, not from me, I tell you no. Joseph, tell us something new. We're tired of that old song. We'll sew the hems and cook the meals. To vote won't take us long. We'll help clean house the one too large for man to clean alone. The state and nation, don't you see, when we the vote have won. Yes, we will, and you'll help, for you'll need our help. Friend Joseph, yes, you will, when we're in, so you'd better help us win. You're just right how blind I've been, I've never seen it thus. Tis true the taxes you must pay without a word or fuss. You are subject to the laws men made, and yes, no word or note. May you sing out where it will count, I'll help you win the vote. Yes, I will, thank you, Joe, and together we'll be voters. Yes, we will, if you'll all vote yes at the polls next fall. With all of the opposition to woman suffrage, there were many uh, anti-woman suffrage songs. This is the one that uh, was the most widely sung. This was written in 1895 by a man named Winthrop Packard, and he used many of the insults, or what were intended to be insults, that were, uh, that were directed at women in the suffrage movement, that they really wanted to be men, that they uh, looked a fright, that they uh, belonged in psychiatric institutions, that they would become old spinsters. In 1849, a natural health care journal called The Water Cure had begun to advocate for women to stop wearing corsets and to stop wearing the long, heavy skirts that they were expected to wear, to start wearing shorter skirts, and to start wearing and to start participating in physical activities. And in 1851, the well-known temp temperance and suffrage leader Amelia Bloomer decla uh, declared that she was going to wear something that tens of thousands of women had begun to wear after after this women started to follow the advice of this journal, and that was uh, shorter skirts with separated legs, like pants. And Amelia Bloomer said she was going to wear those and that she encouraged other women to join her and, and wear them also. And they, uh, and they became associated with her and became called Bloomers. Men hated the idea of women wearing pants. Uh, in the words of the day, women wearing pants usurped male authority. Men also hated the fact that women wearing pants could now participate in physical activities that were previously reserved for men, like riding a bicycle. So here's the 1895 anti-woman suffrage song, Eliza Jane. <laughs> Eliza Jane. 
Eliza Jane, she had a wheel, its rim was painted red. Eliza had another wheel that turned inside her head. She put the two together and gave them both a whirl. And now she rides the parkway sides, a 20th century girl. No more do skirts enfold her, though much her papa grieves. But baggy trousers hold her in their big pneumatic sleeves. For where you see the bloomers bloom, she sits her wheel astride. She makes a sight would stop a fight as through the park she rides. Oh, have you seen Eliza Jane a cycling in the park? Have you seen Eliza Jane? The people all remark. They shout hi hi as she rides by and the little doggies bark. Well, we all have a pain when Eliza Jane goes cycling in the park. It is emancipation year, the woman's movement's on. Eliza plans to be a man, too sad to think upon. She thinks she needs the ballot now, her freedom to enhance. She wants to pose in Papa's clothes, it is for this she... Pants. Eliza had a nice young man, a last was long ago. As gay and fair and debonair as any man you know. He saw her ride in bloomers, he screamed and quickly fled. And as he ran, this nice young man in trembling accent said, Oh, have you seen Eliza Jane a-cycling in the park? Have you seen Eliza Jane, the people all remark? And they shout hi hi as she rides by and the little doggies bark. Well, we all love a pain when Eliza Jane goes cycling in the park. Eliza, dear, we sadly fear you have not started right. You will not see more liberty by being such a fright. Asylum, John, for you, my dear, and in the books we read that bloomers that too early bloom soon fade and go to see. No more upon her red-rimmed wheel the fair Eliza flirts. No more she rides the parkway sides in bifurcated skirts. A park policeman ran her in one day in early spring. Because he thought Eliza taught the little birds to sing. Whoa, have you seen Eliza Jane a cycling in the park? Have you seen Eliza Jane? The people all remark. They shout hi hi as she rides by and the little doggies bark. For we all love a pain when Eliza Jane goes cycling in the park. Funny song, isn't it? But uh, the um, the suffrage movement during the suffrage movement, there were journals of all kinds, suffrage journals. And they published articles on many things other than uh, the right for, for of women to vote. They published articles on on the issues raised by the resolutions passed at the Seneca Falls Convention. They also carried articles on the growing numbers of uh, working women and the growing trade union movement and the issues faced by women at work. They carried articles on sexual discrimination at work. They carried articles on sexual harassment at work. They also carried articles on the growing understanding of the sexual oppression of women, uh, on prostitution, on the sexual double standard. And in 1973, the, uh, and, well, and in the women's liberation movement and, uh, and today, uh, women are fighting uh, over many of the same, same issues. And in 1973, uh, the Women's Liberation Movement and all of us uh, won a great victory when the Supreme Court issued the Roe versus Wade decision, which says that abortion is constitutional and therefore legal, uh, thus giving women uh, some say of, uh, over their reproductive rights, some choice in whether or not to go through with a pregnancy by saying that a woman who wants an abortion can have a legal and therefore safe and affordable abortion. And an issue directly related to abortion is the issue of contraception, birth control. You know, it wasn't really legal, officially legal in this country to use birth control until 1965. There were no federal rules on the, on the subject, but states did, and uh, states could, and 26 states did have laws prohibiting the use of birth control. People went to jail for uh, advocating the use of contraception. And in 1965, the Supreme Court issued a ruling 
uh, uh, prohibiting states from outlawing the use of birth control by married couples. In 1972, the Supreme Court issued a ruling uh, prohibiting states from outlawing the use of birth control by unmarried couples. In 1960, the birth control pill was introduced to this country, and in 1972, Loretta Lynn and some Nashville songwriters wrote a song which she, Loretta Lynn, recorded, and her record company held on to it for several years before releasing it because they knew how controversial it would be. And they were right, when it was released, it uh, was banned on most country stations. It did go to number five on the country charts, which actually was unusual for Loretta Lynn songs, which always went right to number one at the time. It did go to number one on the pop charts in Canada. Uh, and many sociologists feel that this song was uh, instrumental in creating a climate of acceptance in the United States for the use of prescription birth control. Loretta Lynn uh, gave interviews in which she said she talked to lots of doctors, mainly in the rural South, who told her that this song did more to make women feel comfortable and not ashamed to use prescription birth control than any of the literature that they passed out in their clinics or offices. You wined me and dined me when I was your girl. Promised if I'd be your wife, you'd show me the world. All I've seen of this old world is a bed and a doctor bill. I'm tearing down this brooder house cause now I've got the pill. All those years I stayed at home while you had all your fun. And every year that's gone by another baby's come. There's gonna be some changes made right here on Nursery Hill. You've set this chicken your last time cause now I've got the pill. This old maternity dress I've got is going in the garbage. The clothes I'm wearing from now on won't take up so much yardage. Many skirts and hot pants with a few little fancy frills. I'm making up for all those years cause now I've got the pill. I'm tired of all your crowing about how you and your hands play. I'm holding a couple in my arms and another's on the way. This chicken's done tore up her nest and I'm ready to make a deal. And you can't afford to turn it down cause you know I've got the pill. This incubator's overused because you've kept it filled. The feeling good comes easy now that I've got the pill. It's getting dark, it's roosting time, tonight's too good to be real. And daddy, don't you worry none, cause mama's got the pill. Daddy, don't you worry none, cause mama's got the pill. I, uh, I just have, uh, I have two more songs that I'm going to do for you. Uh, and I want to, again, thank you for being a great virtual audience. Uh, and uh, if anybody has any uh, questions, you can, I assume, type them into the comments section and, uh, or comments, and uh, we can get, get to them when the program is over. The, the, uh, suffrage, the suffrage movement, woman suffrage movement uh, in the United States was part of an international movement while it was going on, there were mass women's movements uh, in many places around the world, in Germany. Uh, in Russia, in April of 1917, it was a, uh, a mass march of tens of thousands of women on International Women's Day that started the events that led to the Russian Revolution. There were mass women's movements, lots of them in Northern Europe, in Norway, Denmark, uh, Finland, Sweden, Switzerland. Uh, there were also uh, mass women's movements in Hungary, Turkey, Chile, uh, Japan, 
uh, Australia. The most well-known and most, most militant of the women's suffrage movements was uh, that in England, uh, where the uh, official or the, the major, the leading organization in the suffrage movement was the uh, Women's Social and Political Union, which had as its motto, deeds, not words. They carried out mass leafleting campaigns, national speaking tours, mass marches. They had, in 1908, in Covent Garden in London, uh, a rally and march for suffrage of 250,000 people. They also carried out civil disobedience, probably because Parliament didn't listen to those 250,000 people. Uh, they marched on Parliament, they blocked traffic, they staged sit-ins, they started fires. They had mass window smashing campaigns where they threw potatoes and rocks through the windows of all the members of Parliament who spoke against or voted against women's suffrage. This song was written in 1910 and was the uh, official song of the Women's uh, P Social and Political Union. Uh, the composer of the song was, uh, took, took as her lyrics a poem uh, which had been written by Cecily Hamilton, who was a professional writer and an activist in the women's suffrage movement. And the composer herself was also an activist in the movement. Her name was Ethel Smith. And by trade, she was a, a composer of classical music. And as an aside, Ethel Smith uh, wrote three operas, one of which, Der Walt, in 1903 became the first opera composed by a woman to be performed by the Metropolitan Opera Company of New York. And it remained the only opera composed by a woman performed by the Met for 113 years till 2016. This is Ethel Smith's The March of the Women. past, cowered in dread, from the light of hell, unstrong, strong stand we at last, fearless in faith, with new sight given, strength with its beauty, life with its duty, hear our voice, oh hear and obey, truth, truth beckons us on, open your eyes to the blaze of day. Comrades, ye who have dared first in the battle to strive and to sorrow, scorned, spurned, not have ye cared, raising your eyes to a wider morrow. Ways that are dreary, wait days and ways that are weary, days that are dreary, toil and pain by faith ye have borne. Hail, hail. Victors ye stand, wearing the wreath that the brave have worn. Life, strife, these two are one, naught can ye win but by faith and daring. On, on, all ye have done but for the work of today preparing. Firm in reliance, laugh a defiance, Laugh in hope, for sure is the end. March, march, many is one, shoulder to shoulder and friend to friend. Life, strife, these two are one, naught can ye win but by faith and daring. On, on, all ye have done, but for the work of today preparing. Firm in reliance, laugh a defiance, laugh in hope, for sure is the end. March, march, many is one, shoulder to shoulder and friend to friend. March, march, many is one, shoulder to shoulder and friend to friend.
I'm going to uh, close now with a song which was a, an anthem of the women's liberation movement in the 1960s and 70s, and also is, is still widely sung. Between 1908 and 1912 or so, there were uh, several large strikes of tens of thousands of workers uh, in this country in the textile workers and garment workers industries. There were strikes in Lawrence, Massachusetts, in New York City, in Chicago, uh, and most of the strikers were, were women uh, from uh, the mills, and they uh, were striking for better living wages and also for uh, better and safer working conditions. And uh, most of the leaders, as, as, just as most of the strikers were women, most of the leaders on the ground and the chief organizers of the strikes were women. And most of those uh, women who were organizers of these strikes were also activists and organizers in the women's suffrage movement. In Chicago, in 1910, uh, the, uh, in, in the great Chicago garment workers strike, also called the Hart, Schaffner, and Mark strike, where there were 41,000 workers out on strike, uh, mainly women. Uh, one of the uh, principal organizers of the strike was a woman named Helen Todd, uh, whose actual job was as a factory inspector for the state of Illinois. And that same year of 1910, she was on a speaking tour of Illinois sponsored by a woman's trade union organization, giving speeches around the state in favor of woman suffrage. And in one of those speeches, she used the idea that women and workers need bread and roses. Bread for sustenance, roses for art, beauty, culture, love. And she wrote an article about how she got the idea for that speech, and that article was printed in several journals, and in 1911, uh, an American writer named James Oppenheim uh, read her article and wrote a poem based on the idea of bread and roses. And his poem has been, trans has been set to music many times. John Denver set it to music. The version that is used in the women's movement and that's most widely sung uses music by Mimi Farina, who was Joan Baez's sister and a wonderful singer in her own right. marching, marching in the beauty of the day. A million darkened kitchens, a thousand millwalks gray are struck with all the radiance that a sudden song discloses. For the people here are singing bread and roses, bread and roses. We go marching, marching, we battle too for men, for they are in the struggle, and together we will win. Our lives shall not be sweated from birth until life closes. Hearts starve as well as bodies, give us bread. But give us roses As we go marching, marching Unnumbered women dead Go crying through our singing Their ancient calls for bread Small art and love and beauty Their trudging spirits new Yes, it is bread we fight for, but we fight for roses too. As we go marching, marching, we're standing proud and tall. For the rising of the women 
There's the rising of us all. No more the drudge and idler, time that toil while one reposes, but a sharing of life's glories, bread and roses, bread and roses. As we go marching, marching, we're standing proud and tall. For the rising of the women is the rising of us all. No more the drudge and idler tan that toil while one reposes, but a sharing of life's glories, bread and roses, bread and roses, bread and roses. Thank you all very much. Candace is going to uh, say a, a word or two, I think. Yeah. She's running up this way. Does anyone have any questions for Phil about the program, about any of the songs? If anybody does, just drop them in the comment box and we can ask them. But I want to take the opportunity to thank all of you for joining us. We hope that you enjoyed this program. And again, uh, I put the link to the survey in the event so if you have a few minutes and can leave your feedback on what you thought about today's program we'd really appreciate it and so would illinois humanities and we'd like to thank illinois humanities once again for helping bring phil to do this wonderful live program for us and we hope that you will join us again uh, for our next live program and watch our facebook page for when that will be and thank you all so very much yeah, yeah.